Murray, Murray from Church. Can we just give a hand clap not only to the worship team, but also to God? Let's give a hand this morning we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 8 uh, for today's uh, scripture reading. If you would read with me. It says, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing words of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as all rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for what you're doing here in our presence. We thank you for the worship team. We thank you for uh, Pastor Steve as he brings this message. I pray that you would just speak through him this morning. God, and that the words would not return to you free, that it would land on someone's hearts. God, and change their life forever. Lord, we love you. We just sang the song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. My question for you this morning in our sermon series is, is he really welcome? We sing, let's be more aware of your presence, and we may truly mean that, especially when we think of the Holy Spirit as a dove or a comforter, which is true. The Bible talks about there's no greater comfort than that which we could receive from the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, many of us, whenever we sing the song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. May, your, may we be aware of your presence. You may be feeling it at the moment. God, I really need you. Holy Spirit, I need you to wrap your loving arms around me and comfort me. There's a problem, though. There's a problem when we put God in a box or Jesus in a box or the Holy Spirit in a box. We look at it one-sided. We've been talking the last few Sundays about how the Celtic Christians used another bird to talk about the Holy Spirit. They used the wild goose because as they understood the scripture, they didn't see the Holy Spirit as just a dove or just a comforter. It was the Holy Spirit that got a hold of the hearts of the men and women of God and urged them to move forward, to change things, to do something that in their own heart they thought this is impossible to do. It was the Holy Spirit that grabbed a hold of people and it moved them somewhere. My question for you this morning is, are you comfortable with Holy Spirit? You could be here if you comfort me, but Holy Spirit, I don't want you here if you move me. That's what today's message is all about. You know, Jesus Christ, God himself, he had many ways to get our attentions. And quite often, he got our attention in the Bible by saying some absurd things, some interesting things, ways to get our attention. If you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Whenever he's talking to a particular church here, he uses a very interesting illustration. Don't miss this. When he's talking to this church in the book of Revelation chapter 3, he wants to make sure and get them out of their comfort zone. He wants them to wake up. You'll notice in the scriptures quite often that idea of awaking or waking up. Why? Because I think oftentimes as Christians, we become complacent and we need to be woke up. And when he's talking about this particular church, the church at Laodicea, there is a very interesting illustration he uses to get their attention. He says something like this in the letter. He says, church, he said, whenever I have a taste 
of your spirituality. Whenever I sample what it is that you have to offer, this is what I get. I'm excited. Church, what do you have to offer with your spirituality? Kind of sad, isn't it? In a minute, we're going to read the scripture where he says, I'd rather you be hot, I'd rather you be cold, but you are lukewarm. And he said, because you are lukewarm, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Amen. Now, why would your pastor use such an illustration? You know, I struggled with the whole idea of spewing on the stage because I thought, man, that's going to make someone upset. I really felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to do it. Why? Because I believe he was trying to get the attention of a church here and saying, wake up. You've got this idea of Christianity all one-sided. In fact, you're not showing much of Christianity to me at all. You see, I want to give you a little description of this church. Laodicea, the actual place where this church was at, was founded by Antiochus II in the middle of the 3rd century, and it was actually named after his wife, Laodice. Today, the city is known as Eskahizar, meaning the old fortress. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. It was situated about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia on the road to Colossae. Under the Romans, Laodicea had become wealthy, which was due partly to the production of a wool cloth that they had. New Testament scholar Robert H. Mounts in his study of Revelation says, By careful breeding, a soft, glossy black wool had been produced, which was much in demand and brought fame to this region of Laodicea. Although Paul was acquainted with the church, he had not visited the church. He mentions the church four times, though, in the letters that he wrote to the Colossians. The speaker here is Christ when we read in the book of Revelation. And he instructs John to write his words to the angel of the church at Laodicea. Again, Revelation chapter 3, beginning with 14. We're going to read through verse 17 and we'll continue in a minute. He says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit or spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're speaking to a rich church or not. What the Bible is very clear here is Jesus needed to get their attention and let him know, I'd rather you completely be cold toward me or completely hot. I don't like this idea of lukewarm Christianity. I want you to be full on, 100%. Amen. I won't just want you to be comforted by the Holy Spirit. I want you to be moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And when the Holy Spirit works, it causes action and movement. And he wants something different out of you, something different out of your life. Christ felt this way about the church in Laodicea. Unless they change, he would spew them out of his mouth. And although the language is strong... Their condition is not final because Christ issues them a call to repentance. So it's one good thing that he catches their attention and he lets them know, I am going to give you another chance, though, to get hot for me. I'm going to give you a chance. Yes, I'm giving you this wake-up call, but I want you to change. And here's what he tells them beginning in verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold we find by fire so that you may be rich. It's a different type of richness. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Now he's giving them spiritual examples. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now I'm going to stop there for a minute. 
because it could be really easy to read over that part and not understand something else about Laodicea. Laodicea was known for her medical college. And in that medical college, one of the things that they came about was this thing called Phrygian powder. It was used to make eye salve. And these Phrygian physicians would aid men in their physical blindness. It's important to know that whenever Jesus is talking to them, he's using things that they can relate to. And he's letting them know that, yes, you've come up with some incredible things, and you've done some great things as a church. In fact, here in Laodicea, you are known for your medical school, and you've come up with this, this powder that is included in ISAF so that men who are once blinded can see. But I'm telling you, as a Christian right now, you're living your life spiritually as though you are blind. And he said, I'm calling you away from the blindness. I'm calling you towards the eye salve that I have for you. Verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. He said, that's the reason I'm being so forward with you. So be zealous and repent. You know what zealous is, right? It means zeal. One of the very things he's getting on to them is don't be Lukewarm. I want you to be hot again. I want you to get zeal. I want you to be movable. I want the Holy Spirit to lead in your life. I want you to know when the Holy Spirit is leading in your life. And I want you to do something about it. I want you to be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as also I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Jesus' main challenge was this. You are stuck in sameness. You are lukewarm, and this should not be so if you are led by the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, the cage we're going to be talking about that many of us keep the wild goose in is the cage of the customary. The cage of the customary. The cage of the routine. In a few minutes, we're going to be talking about Moses and Moses' desert. And if you look at the front of your bulletin, you'll notice I changed the name of the message. That was done on purpose. Because it was the cage of comfort. But in a minute, whenever we talk about Moses, I want you to stop and think, was Moses really comfortable doing what he had been doing for 40 years? No, it was customary, it was the routine, but it doesn't mean it was comfortable to him. Sometimes what holds us back is our comfort. Sometimes what holds us back is just <coughs> the customary, the routine. It's the way we've always done it. It's the way we plan to always do it. And the Holy Scare Spirit cannot move us to do anything different. It's the cage of the customary, the cut and dry. Faith. It's more than a prayer. It's more than a Sunday service. It's a life of abandon and risk. Now don't miss this. I mentioned it before that I come back to it. But Laodicea today, her name today means old fortress. <clears throat> For many of us, we'd say, man, that's a good name. But think of the word fortress. Old fortress, meaning it's been there for a long time, and it's the same. It's unmovable. It's a fortress. Is that really what God wanted? Did he want Laodicea? Do you think they ever got zealous? Did they ever get on fire for God? Or they just looked at as, oh, that's the old fortress. They're the same. They're never going to change. I wonder if people say that about some of our churches. I wonder if they say that about our life. Oh, I don't know about her because she's still the same. I don't know if the Holy Spirit is really leading in that person's life because he is still the same. What kind of change has the Holy Spirit riled up in you? Have you followed the Holy Spirit? Are you even listening to the Holy Spirit whenever he calls out? One author wrote this, God offers us security through risk. We want safety through certainty. All of us want God to behave himself in our lives. 
to touch this area, but leave this one alone. To empower us here, but let us run things ourselves over there. You know, there's so many illustrations I could use, and I don't want to just step on everyone's toes, but let's say that sometime in the next two months, the Holy Spirit told you, you knew it was the Holy Spirit, and he was saying, I want you to take a mission trip to the Philippines, and you're scared to death of getting on an airplane. So do you tell God no? Or do you say, Holy Spirit, if you really want me to go, I am movable. Are you really movable? Or have you set perimeters on the Holy Spirit? Now, that may sound funny to you, but we do that often. That's just one illustration. I told you before, if the Holy Spirit has ever led you during the service to come forward and to bow here, to pray, Amen. why do you do that? Because the Holy Spirit tells you. Not because someone's going to, you know, comfort you there. The whole idea is you follow because the Holy Spirit, what? The Holy Spirit is leading. Amen. And if you sit in your pew, then you've got to ask yourself, am I being lukewarm? Am I allowing the Holy Spirit? I want him to comfort me, but don't make me step out. Don't make me teach a Sunday school class. Don't make me do this Holy Spirit. And God cannot use us as individuals or as a church because we put ourselves in a box. We're in a cage of the customary. This is my routine. Do not move me. I don't want to change this in my life. The Holy Spirit leads in different ways. In the first century, the church was anything but a safe place. It was dangerous. And beyond the persecution that they were receiving, the early church played offense. The early church didn't just sit back and say, what happens, happens. They knew that there was persecution, and yet they still followed the Holy Spirit wherever the Holy Spirit was leading. They couldn't care if the Holy Spirit said do it. They said, let's do it. They didn't check the budget to see if it could figure things out. They just said, if that's the way the Holy Spirit's leading, we're going to make it happen. They didn't check with their job to see if there was any availability. They just said, okay, I will follow you and be a fishers of man. And they left their nets behind. Amen. Do we have that type of Christianity today anywhere? We often take the Jesus of the Bible and twist him into a version of Jesus that we are most comfortable with. David Platt commented this. He said, a nice, middle-class American Jesus. A Jesus who doesn't mind materialism and who would never call us to give away everything we have. A Jesus who is fine with a nominal devotion that does not infringe on our comforts because, after all, he loves us just the way we are. A Jesus who wants us to be balanced and who, for that matter, wants us to avoid <coughs> danger altogether. A Jesus who brings us comfort and prosperity as we live out our Christian spin on the American dream. Wow. I think that was his wake-up call. <coughs> Jesus tried to get the church of Laodicea's attention by illustrating a spewing. With Moses, his attention was God in a different way. In Exodus 3, God gets Moses' attention and he wakes him up in a unique way. We're going to talk about Moses' desert this morning. Moses' desert. And by the way, whenever you don't allow the Holy Spirit to lead and you're stuck in your routine and you don't allow him to move in your life, your life spiritually is like a dry desert. Moses is a fugitive. In his anger, he killed an Egyptian taskmaster and ends up fleeing Egypt and land in a place and lands in a place called Midian. And for 40 years, on the backside of the desert, he is tending sheep. And part of me wonders if Moses at this point feels rather forsaken or rather forgotten by God. And maybe it was he that had <coughs> forgotten God. Needless to say, he had been 40 years here. 40 years is a long time on the backside of the desert in the middle of nowhere. Think about it. Moses had been tending sheep for 40 years. That's 480 months, 2,080 weeks, 14,560 days. He's had the same routine for 40 years, day in, day out, and I think that Moses must feel like he has been put out to pasture. And part of me wonders if Moses at this point is a little bit disappointed with his life. 
I don't know. He was either comfortable or he was what? He was stuck in routine, the customary. And something had to get his attention. Something had to make him move forward and change it up a little bit. Amen. He has so much potential. I've got to think at this point, he's got to feel a little bit like an underachiever. Every day he stares at the backsides of sheep. Not really exciting. I would suggest that 40 years, Moses is caught in the cage of a customary. And this is where we pick up his story in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. What was he trying to get him to do? The same thing he tried to get the church at Laodicea to see. Wake up. Look. Pay attention to what's going on around you. He finally, God gets his attention and he sees. God then calls to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. You never know when or where or how the Holy Spirit can invade the reality of your life and turn your life inside out and upside down in a single day if you would just allow him to. Amen. He can show up any place, any time, and turn your life into a wild goose chase. Amen. For me, that fills me with holy anticipation. That gets me excited. Because you know what? I've told you before, I just don't want to be another pastor. I want the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. I've read several books on the church on how to be a pastor. You know how many of them I follow? Very few. Because I want to follow the Holy Spirit. And yes, I might get ideas, but I'm just not going to follow the latest fad, the latest Bible study that's out there. I'm going to do what I believe the Holy Spirit is leading. And you ought to be a church of holy anticipation. You ought to be on the edge of your seat and say, I can't wait to see what God does with Refuge Church. Amen. If we will just let the Holy Spirit move. But the thing is, he doesn't just want to do it with me or my family. He wants to do it with you. Amen. And as long as you are stuck in the routine or the customary and you don't let the Holy Spirit move you, whether it's an invitation or to join the church as a member or to teach a Sunday school class or to work in the nursery or to just show up every once in a while, then how is the Holy Spirit going to do something amazing among us? How are we going to reach the lost in the community? How are we going to feed the poor? We've got to listen. We've got to see. We've got to wake up. We've got to pay attention to the Holy Spirit. Amen. I can't wait to see what God is going to do next. It's how I live my life. Now, I don't want to paint a prettier picture than it is because I live in a daily routine, too. And sometimes even I get caught up in the cage. And sometimes life can seem pretty monotonous. My days don't start real glamorous. I take my medicine. I shave. I get dressed. I walk cayenne. I pick up his poop. I wake up Caden. I start the coffee. I prepare for my day. That's how my day starts. But I do live with this deep, holy anticipation of what God is going to do. Because you never know how he can invade the reality of your life. And he's done it several times. I remember some of my planning. I've had a schedule plan. And instead I've got a phone call about something that's happened in the church. Or someone who needs something. Or something that needs to be cared for. And it used to be that would drive me crazy. Because I'm a to-do list person. I'm like, oh great. If I had this plan and this plan. Not anymore. Now I'm like, God, whatever you have for me today, whatever's on that list will still be there tomorrow. 
If someone gets sick, if someone ends up in the hospital, if someone dies, if someone needs to be shared with, if I need to go to lunch with someone, I can drop some of these other things because there's other things, Holy Spirit. I need to be led by you and know when you're calling and do what you want me to do. Amen. Moses, he needed a wake-up call. He probably had no clue what was about to happen because he was stuck in the cage of the customary or the routine. But what about other people in the Bible? Noah, when he was about 500, did he know that he was going to build a big boat? A shepherd named David knew that he would become king. An orphan named Esther knew she would become a queen. I think Moses thought that he could tend sheep until the day he died. I think he literally felt unqualified and disqualified for anything else because of the murder that had taken place in his life. He had no idea that what he would go that he would go back and confront Pharaoh and that he would become a human vessel that would reveal the glory of God in the ten miracles and that he would be the one after 400 years of captivity would lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and toward the promised land. But he had to be woke up. He had to be able to be moved by the Holy Spirit out of his routine. Now, over the last few weeks, we've come up with these clever little words. And don't know if I'll have a fourth one next week. But the first week, we talked about wild goosebumps. About Nehemiah not being caged by the common. And following a God-given passion that was in his heart. And I asked you, are you following the passion that's in your heart? How are you using that? If something makes you cry, if something makes you weep or makes you mad or sad, maybe God's calling you to do something about that, to fix that in this world. That may be part of your purpose, is to make a difference in that area in your life. Then the next week, it went from wild goose bumps to a wild goose chase. And Paul not being caged by his casualties, following God through an unmapped terrain. Today I want to talk about the wild goose call. The wild goose call. Following God with an attentive heart of obedience. So we've got to ask ourselves, first of all, do you know when it's the Holy Spirit calling or if it's just you? Because yes, in a sermon like this, we can easily be motivated just by somebody's words. Something that is said can get a hold of us and say, yeah, i got to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. God uses words. He uses his word. He used a letter to the church of Laodicea, did he not? And so can he not speak to you through a pastor or through words? Yes, he can. But how do you know if you're truly being led by the Holy Spirit? What about this call? First of all, you are not going to have a call from the Holy Spirit unless you're what? Unless that call is to be born again, unless you are born again, that's the only call you're going to hear. Because until you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit lives within you, then you will be hearing the Holy Spirit and he should be leading in your life. Amen. But then the question is, do some of us, because of our routine and our customary, have we grown attention to or gotten used to a point where we can just silence the Holy Spirit in our life. We've told him no so many times, we don't even know when it's him or not that it's telling us something to do. We've got to ask ourselves these questions. The main thing is when we figure out the wild goose call, we need to follow with an attentive heart. That means wake up and pay attention. And we need to obey. All this happens to Moses. And Moses finally has the day when Boom, God shows up. In the midst of his customary, in the midst of his routine, in a fiery bush, he gets his attention. It seems like there would be better places or ways to do it. Why a burning bush in the middle of nowhere? Jewish scholars came to a consensus, and they said they believed it was God's way of showing that no place is devoid of his presence. Not even a bush on the backside of the desert, he could show up any place. Rick McKinley said this, he's a pastor, and he said, his kingdom, God's kingdom, is a heavenly reality that lands smack in the middle of everyday life. But do we pay attention to the Holy Spirit when he leads in our everyday life? Moses is caught a little off guard, but I love the simple response he gives to the wild goose's call. The wild goose calls out, God calls out, Moses, Moses. 
And Moses' simple response is, here I am. Amen. Now, wait a minute. God knows exactly where he's there at. He put the bush there, or made the bush that was already there catch fire, and he spoke through the bush. God knows exactly where you are, Moses, but thanks for sharing. No, it's more like this. Here I am, like the accumulative 40 years of what am I doing here? What is God doing? Why am I forsaken or forgotten? And I am ready to move from my cage of the customary. So whenever he answers, here I am, he's like, God, I'm ready. Just give it to me. I am ready for anything different. And so no, maybe he wasn't in a place of comfort, but he was in a place of routine and the Holy Spirit is calling him. And my question for you this morning is when the Holy Spirit calls, do you say, here I am, I'm ready to move. Are you ready? <coughs> Fishermen, political activists in the New Testament, Christ's call was to do what? Follow me. And these fishermen, political activists, tax collectors with careers, they're with families and a future. They get up and they leave everything. Why would they give up all they knew to follow Jesus and to what they didn't know? They knew that life's greatest adventure was waiting beyond, that real life was following the Holy Spirit, however the Holy Spirit would lead. Christ himself said, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever abandons his life will find life to its fullest. Now, I'm not saying that God is calling everyone in the church to up and leave their job tomorrow and to step out into some type of ministry. What I am saying, though, is are you paying attention to where God has you? And when he calls you, maybe even where you're at, to speak up about Christ, to win someone to the Lord, to invite them to church, are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Or are you so stuck in the routine of, I can't speak to everybody, or what will they think of me if I speak up? Hey, there was another person that was afraid about how he would set sound if he spoke up, right, in the Bible. How am I going to sound if I speak up or I follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? God's call. Well, if you're born again and you're reading scripture with an open heart, God can speak to you in unique ways. And by the way, how can they hear without a preacher? Yes, we do need to hear the word of God. But many of you know Moses' story here. He puts up some resistance. He second guesses himself. He second guesses God. But I want to suggest that this is where the wild goose chase begins. When you say, here I am. I am ready to be moved by you, Spirit. I am ready to figure out how you want me to serve, how you want me to make a difference with my life. Here I am. Then there may be some of you that will say, God, I'm not qualified for that, or are you sure? But the thing is, is Moses had his arguments, but he still what? He still followed. He still did it. He still said, okay, I'm going to follow the obedience of the call. I'm not going to be stuck in the routine and just do the same thing I've always done. This is not just some self-absorbed attempt of me preaching on adventure because I like adventure. Because if you know me, I'm the opposite of adventure. Roller coasters, I used to hate them until one day I went with a young man and there were supposed to be other young men supposed to show up. Only one kid showed up. And of course this kid said what at the amusement park? I love roller coasters. And the Holy Spirit's telling me, well, if you're going to be what you need to be for him today, then you need to ride roller coasters. And I'm like, really? Anything but roller coasters? And I know it's a silly illustration, but guess what? I got on the roller coaster again and again. After about five times, my hands were up in the air. My eyes were open. I'm like, woo, this is fun. And I love roller coasters to this day. But I'm not even interest type. My wife talks about whenever she was growing up, how she would do some mountain climbing and spelunking and all this crazy stuff. And I watch people do that. I watch them on TV jump off cliffs and hand gliders, and my hands are sweating, and I came and watched someone else do it on TV, let alone do it myself. No, this isn't some attempt to me of me just saying, I want to speak about adventure. It's so much more than that. 2,000 years ago, Jesus extended an invitation. He said, come, follow me. There's movement there. 
That invitation is still on the table. And the wild goose chase begins the moment we put our faith in Christ and decide to follow him. And so what do we need to do? It's simple. We need to respond to the call of the wild goose to move. We need to respond to his call to move. Because the Holy Spirit's call isn't to sit and do nothing. The Holy Spirit's call isn't to get comfortable in the routine. The Holy Spirit's call isn't to just sit and do the same thing over and over and over again. Now, there are some things that are helpful with that. Yes, it's good to have a routine and a schedule per se. But sometimes we do what? We don't allow the Holy Spirit to move because of that. We need to respond to the Holy Spirit's call to go. The Apostle Paul urged Christ's followers with these words. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, he didn't want the routine, the customary. He said, I'm pressing on. I'm going to follow that call. I'm going to respond to the call to move. For Paul, the call was not as much a destination as a journey. Also, it was one that required commitment and moving forward in faith, as we learned last week. It also is one that holds the promise of the prize. You see, the simple fact that God has to capture Moses' attention tells me that God has lost Moses' attention. Or Moses has stopped paying attention to God. I think that's what the customary or the routine does. We need routine. Without routine, life is absolutely chaotic. But once a routine becomes a routine, you need to disrupt the routine. Now, a few of the things I'm about to give you are just some practical tips in your everyday life. Then we'll get back to the actual call of the Holy Spirit. But think of some of those things that in your life have maybe become routine. And maybe the Holy Spirit is telling you, I want you to switch it up a little bit and change some of that routine. Practical ways to disrupt your routine. One of them is this. You know, I think quite often instead of really worshiping from this deep place, down deep in our soul, where we're really thinking about what we are singing, that we need to, every once in a while, listen to and accept and love some new songs. Amen. Now, I love some of the old songs of the faith. I love the hymns, which, by the way, if you go on our website and you look forward like another month or so, you're going to see we're going to have a hymn sing on a Sunday night. So get excited about that. Next month we're going to ask you for your favorite hymn songs and we're going to have a hymn sing. I love the hymns. There are some hymns that are near and dear to me. But just because I like that and that was my routine doesn't mean that God may not have something to me in a new song. In fact, does not the Bible tell us sing to the Lord a new song? There ought to be a new song in our heart every day, whether you're making it up in your heart or whether you're listening to it. Now, I know not every song is going to attract every person. But the thing is, the some of us need to shake it up when it comes to our worship and even our worship music. Because every once in a while, we get so used to singing the same thing. Do we even mean it? Did you ever even think about the song that we sang this morning, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here, differently than him just to comfort you? Had you thought about it until I said something? Sometimes we get so caught up singing the same songs over and over again that we miss the message even in the song. Amen. What about your devotion time? Maybe try a new translation of the Bible. Try something different. Read and see things in a new way. Maybe just a different word use there will grab your attention more than it ever has before. What about fasting? Now, I believe there's a purpose for fasting. But I also believe that fasting is a great way to do what? To break a habit or build a habit. That's part of the idea. To get your focus back on God, you're stopping something for a while. And it's not always food. You can have a media fast. I'm going to fast from electronics for a while. I'm going to fast from my video games. And I'm going to use that time that I usually use on video games or TV to focus on God's word and the study. 
Some of us may need to do that to do what? To jar ourselves, to get us out of the routine. What about going on a retreat or a mini vacation? Something as simple as just getting away for a short time. Maybe, hey, I, I didn't have this in here, but maybe some of our marriages would do much better if we would do what? If we would just, like uh, we had the wonderful song last week, shake it up a little bit. Change things. Change it up. Change the routine. Maybe the reason marriages got boring is because you're not doing the same thing you did before you got married. You haven't done the sweet little notes or the cards. Change the routine up a little bit and see if the fire might come back. You know, we could talk about so many things here. Go on a missions trip. That could be a way to, like, jar you out of who you are and what you're doing and make you realize there's more going on than what's just happening within your little box. Start serving. <coughs> Join a table group. Lead a table group. There are many ways that you can disrupt the routine. The main thing, though, that he tells Moses is this. He said, take out your sandals. You're on holy ground. Celebrate this moment. I'm speaking to you. And I'm showing up in your midst. Do you not realize I want something more from your life than just the customary? I want you to follow the call to move forward. Forty years, that's a long time to stay caged. David Platt again said this. He said, I could not help but think that somewhere along the way, we had missed what it is radical about our faith and replaced it with what is comfortable. We were settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. The problem with many of churches today is that there are too many people who spend their time remembering the congregation's past days of glory. They are the old fortress. Instead of envisioning its future, stepping out in faith, taking risks, and making a difference in their communities. 20th century missionary C.T. Studd said this, one of my favorite quotes ever about the church. C.T. Studd said, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Man. See what he's saying there? I want to follow the call wherever that may be. And it may mean that it takes some risk out of safety, out of customary. That call may lead me to where I'm not comfortable, but following the Holy Spirit's call, I will never have more joy when I abandon my life and I follow him. What could happen if God's people abandoned themselves to the risky faith of the past, the wild goose call? What if we could put aside many of our differences and comforts and join hands together bringing Christ's kingdom of love, healing, and restoration to the world? At this time, I'm going to call those who are going to be leading our final worship songs to go ahead and come forward. In a minute, we're going to have a time of invitation. But I want to do one of those things I mentioned a minute ago. I want to read to you a scripture, maybe from a, not a translation, but a paraphrase that often we may not read from, and that's okay. It is a paraphrase, by the way. But one thing I do like about the message paraphrase, although I think it messes with scripture quite a bit, so you've got to be careful with the paraphrase. But every once in a while, I like the message paraphrase because it does what? It grabs my attention like it never has before. It makes me want to go back to my ESV or NIV or KJV and study it more because something got my attention that never got it before. And one of these scriptures comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 11 through 15 in the message paraphrase. Listen at the paraphrase here. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. Don't miss this. The whole idea of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is that of resurrection and life. Then why don't we have it in our own lives? It's because we deafen the Holy Spirit's call. And so we don't live the life that he has for us. Delivered from that dead life, with his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. 
The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. I love it. Get on, get on past the mundane. Get on past the customary and the routine. God has given you so much more. Amen. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, great tending life. It's adventurously expected, greeting God with a child life. What's next, Papa? That's the here I am. What's next, Papa? When's the last time you said that? Holy Spirit, what's next? I'm ready to go. I'll do whatever you have me to do. I'm going to listen to your call. Whatever you do, you're going to experience that wild goose chase. And it may take you places you never expected to be. But boy, life will be better than you ever thought it could. Because when you follow the Holy Spirit, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. I'm going to close with this story. Soren Kierkegaard had a classic story that he named Duckland. And it parts some very insightful wisdom to us. It was Sunday morning in Duckland, and all the ducks dutifully came to church, wobbling through the doors and down the aisle to their pews where they comfortably squatted. When all were well settled and the hymns were sung, the duck minister waddled to his pulpit, opened the duck Bible, and read, Ducks, you have wings. And with wings, you could fly like eagles. You could soar in the sky. Use your wings. It was a marvelous, elevating duck reading from the Duck Bible. And thus, all the ducks quacked their ascent with a hearty, Amen! And then they plopped down from their pews. And they wobbled. Let's pray. Father, you want so much more from us than a waddle. You want us to mount up on eagle's wings. Spirit, you want us to move when you say move. But God, are we listening? Are we paying attention or as our routine, our customary? God, has it gotten in the way? God, I ask that today there might be some that would say, okay, Holy Spirit, you've been dealing with me about this a long time. I'm going to get cared for this morning. Or Holy Spirit, I want to be open. Am I not listening? Am I not hearing you? Am I even born again? God, help us ask those questions. They're important questions. Because you don't want us to live this life just like everybody else. You want to pull us out of the main mundane and into the adventurous. You want us to take, take us out of the comfortability and into risk. God, you want us to get out of our customary routine and follow you with an obedient, attentive heart whenever you say, my child, I want you to move. And I will lead us to a place where we say, God, here I am. Let that be our prayer. May many this morning say, God, Holy Spirit, here I am. Thank you for it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as the Holy Spirit leads? Would you let him lead?